Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where tour players, legends, and the top instructors in the game share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by TaylorMade Golf, the PGA Tour Superstore, Two Under, Golf Pride, Strixon Cleveland Golf. Your best performance starts with the right golf ball. Sun Mountain Golf Bags, Finn Scooters, making the game more fun. Idel Golf, hit it, flip it, dial it in. And the Mclemore Club Experience, live above the clouds. Now, here's your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining me on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro. I'm back, fresh off my annual trip with my buddies. As you all know, we went back to the Mclemore for a second straight year, and it never disappoints. They put us up in a fantastic three-bedroom townhouse right off the fifth tee box. The course was in outstanding shape. The vistas, folks, from 2,000 feet up on Lookout Mountain are just stunning. Playing the famed 18th hole, which Lynx Magazine is rated as one of the top 10 finishing holes in all of golf, is something you have to play to fully appreciate. It's like playing a hole floating in the air. I'm proud to say I parted it the first day. Had a little trouble in the right greenside bunker in the second round, so I made a bogey. But thank you to Tom Patry and Bill Bergen, who, as you guys know, is a a course co-designer up there for their swing and strategy tips. After looking like I never played the game before in our opening nine holes, I found my swing rhythm, played some good golf, really enjoyed the course over the last 27 holes. I walked away wishing I was a member up there. It's such a fun course to play. It must be great to be able to play it on a regular basis. Plus the restaurant that they have on site, the Craig, is fantastic. Great food, great service. And as Bill Bergen mentioned when he joined us a couple of weeks ago, they are about to open up their new Himalayas putting course, which looks outstanding and a lot of fun to play. Plus, they've got some other exciting news coming up later this summer. So if you're looking for a great buddies trip, or if you live anywhere near eastern Tennessee or northwestern Georgia, and you haven't been to Macklemore yet, check it out online by going to themacklemore.com. Okay, on to tonight's show. My first guest is going to be LPGA legend Jane Blaylock. Jane has quickly become one of my all-time favorite guests. She's so much fun to talk to. Tonight, I'll get her thoughts on the upcoming Legends of the LPGA tournaments that kick things off next week up at Pinehurst. We'll also look ahead to mid-July to the Senior LPGA Championship. Plus, I'll get her thoughts on this week's U.S. Women's Open at Pine Needles, a place where they played the Senior U.S. Women's Open back in 2019. Jane will join me here in just a few minutes. Following her, our resident director of instruction, Tom Patry, will be back. TP and I will look back at the PGA Championship. We'll also talk about the rise of Stephen Alker on the Champions Tour. Stephen has gone from going through Monday qualifying to winning three times in his last five events on the Champions Tour, including last week's Senior PGA Championship. And his other two finishes, oh, by the way, were a second and a third. We'll also get into Tiger's Summer Outlook plus how he would go about getting Jordan Spieth back to his 2015 putting form. Tom will join me about 25 minutes from now. Following him, I'll be joined by Jeff Tracy. Jeff is the host of the Grilling at the Green show. He also hosts a barbecue show called Barbecue Nation. So he marries two things we all love, golf and grilling out. We'll delve deeply into both of those things when he joins me a little bit later on in the hour. Then we'll round out tonight's show with a return visit from Golf Channel host Damon Hatt. I'll get Damon's thoughts as well on the PGA Championship and Tiger struggles. Painful to watch Tiger limp around out there, folks. We'll also look ahead to this week's tournament on the PGA Tour. They're up at Jack's Place for the Memorial. Plus, I'll get his thoughts on when or if we'll see Phil Mickelson again this year. Damon will join me about an hour from now. So there you have it, folks. More great stories, tips, and information are coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Tee. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. Before we get started, this segment of the show is brought to you by TaylorMade. Golf's an interesting game, folks, because the better you hit the ball, the fewer shots you actually have to hit. That means the better you hit the ball, the less golf you have to play. That's why TaylorMade made the all-new Stealth Irons. 
Tailor-made stealth irons feature a catback design with 3D toe wrap designed to help deliver increased distance throughout the bag and more forgiveness on those occasional, or maybe not so occasional, less than perfect shots. The result? Better shots more often, so you get to have more fun more often. So if you're the kind of golfer who wants to play less golf more often, try the all-new Stealth Irons from TaylorMade. Beyond Driven. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is LPGA Hall of Famer Jane Blaylock. Let me remind you about Jane's background. She's from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She played her college golf at Rollins College down in Winter Park, Florida, just outside of Orlando, where she graduated with her degree in history. She was inducted into their Hall of Fame in 1977. She won the New Hampshire Amateur Championship three times from 1965 to 1968. She won the Florida Intercollegiate Championship in 1966 and the New England Amateur Championship in 1968. She turned pro in 69 and was named the LPGA Rookie of the Year. She got her first win on tour here in Atlanta at the 1970 Lady Carling event. She was named the Most Improved Golfer on Tour in 1970 and 71. Jane won the inaugural Dinah Shore Colgate Winter Circle Tournament, which was the richest prize ever on the LPGA Tour at the time. She would go on to win the Colgate Triple Crown in 1975 and 77. She teamed with Raymond Floyd to win the Mixed Championship in 1978. She holds the professional golf record for consecutive cuts made at 299. In 1983, she became only the seventh player in LPGA Tour history to reach a million dollars in career earnings. She was named the 1985 Comeback Player of the Year, coming back from a herniated disc in her back. In all, Jane won 27 times on the LPGA Tour and four more times over on the Japanese Tour. She was inducted into the Legends Hall of Fame in 2014, into the New Hampshire Golf Hall of Fame in 2018, and I'm very honored she is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Jane, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Chris. Wow, I'm exhausted thinking about my career. (laughs) (laughs) I was busy. (laughs) Yes, you were, and really good at it, too, by the way. (laughs) I guess so. Jane, it's been a little bit since we got to have you as part of the show. Catch us up. What's been going on with you so far this year? Well, um, just working on my golf game. I'm playing in a couple of our Legends tournaments this year, our Orlando Lakes in Minneapolis in mid-August, and our BJ's, uh, the team championship. My partner is Patricia Manu-Labu, and it's, uh, that's at the Ridge Club in Sandwich, you know, in Cape Cod. It's a great event, fabulous field. And then uh, we're working diligently on our women's PGA golf clinics. Uh, we picked up AIG as a presenting sponsor this year. So uh, we've been doing that for many years, but this is our best year ever. So we're doing these one-day events, uh, really introducing women to the game of golf, and kind of elevating their networking experience, um, you know, all over the country. So, uh, yeah, I guess I, I guess I remain busy. So for the ladies out there that want to get involved in the clinic, how can they get more information about it? Well, we have a website. It's womenspgaclinics.com. It has our schedule. It has the price. It has the agenda. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. As we've been doing it for a while, we bring in the finest LPGA and PGA women coaches. Uh, we're at great clubs all around the country and it's just, uh, It's just definitely an elevated women's networking experience. And Jane, the legends of the PGA LPGA Tour, you guys get rolling next week up at Pinehurst. Talk about the Legends Tour Challenge that is sponsored by our friends over at Golf Pride. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, Kathy Johnston Forbes uh, really uh, pulled that event together. It's a two-day event, one-day pro-am, one-day competition, Country Club of North Carolina, which is – which is fabulous. So it's on Monday, Tuesday. Um, a really great field, 24 players. You know, some of those players playing are, uh, well, Kathy Laura Diaz, who won our BJs last year, Donna Andrews, who's a North Carolina product, Rosie Jones, Michelle Redman, uh, Hollis Stacy. So we've got, uh, you know, a few Hall of Famers in there. So that's going to be, um, a wonderful event. And it's, uh, you know, the Pro-Am is called Elevating the Dream uh, Pro-Am, and it's really to kind of pay tribute to those uh, hospital workers who put so much on the line during our, well, not that it's over, but it's part of our whole COVID issue that we've been uh, enduring for, for years. So, uh, And it ties in with National 
um, Survivor's Day, Cancer Survivor's Day, which is June 5th. So it's a, it, it's a great event. And Jane, as we look a little bit later on this summer to mid July, the senior LPGA championship is going to be held at Salina Country Club up in Salina, Kansas. The course there dates back to 1911, a rich history in the women's game. Talk about the tournament and the decision to play there. Well, you know, for years that, well, we used to have a legend championship at French Lick and the folks at French Lick were so good to us and they had the senior LPGA there for a couple of years and um, I guess sometimes they you know events run their course and they decided that it was time to go in a different direction and so uh, the LPGA selected um, you know Kansas as a site and it's important that um, you know look what the PGA has done for the PGA seniors it really is um it, it's about time the LPGA stepped up and we want them not just to continue this event to really elevate the LPGA senior championship because where would they be without the Drill Inksters and Nancy Lopez's and you know all those Laura Davies all those great players so uh we hope this event will um there's a question mark around it that it will continue if it's in Kansas or another market but uh it's such an important part of golf to have the uh, LPGA senior continue. Jane, talking about the women's game and major championships, back in the mid-70s, you lobbied for a women's masters tournament. And with the uh, <laughs> Augusta National Women's Amateur event that they host there now, maybe Augusta National isn't the site for a women's masters, but talk about wanting that tournament, and is that something now that as we see more money starting to be poured into the LPGA. Is that something that we could see? Well, you never know, but, you know, ironically, and there's a, quite a history to that because I think it was Northwestern Mutual sponsored. It was called the Women Masters at uh, Moss Creek uh, Country Club in Hilton Head. And then uh, the Masters, uh, I actually <laughs> went with the, for the LPGA testifying court <coughs> against Cliff Roberts. And you can imagine what that was like because the Masters uh, was upset that the LPJ was using that name. Um, so I think that we've come a long way since that time. I mean, they host the women's amateur, but I think to have a win <clears throat> women Masters would be absolutely sensational. And obviously, I think I've spent my life lobbying, as you know. Um, we finally got the U.S. Women's Senior Open. Only took 20 years, but you know, you just <laughs> perseverance, you hang in there and you just do the best you can. So I got to ask you, why why was Cliff Roberts upset with the use of, of the name the Masters? I mean, we see, you know, every country, there's there's a Masters all over the place, European tour, that sort of thing. What upset him about that? Because he was Cliff Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was Augusta. So I need I say any more. <laughs> uh, I will never forget a period. And, and the court, when I testified on behalf of the LPGA, it was in Augusta. <laughs> so, oh my. Um, I think, I think the, um, you know, the, um, the cards were definitely stacked against us, but, um, we lost that, but it was, uh, it was such a great event we had at Moss Creek. And, uh, so there is precedent to that. And it would be great to, uh, to have it to, to kind of re, uh, you know, have a rebirth of that event. Yeah, it would. Is there is there any discussion? Is that anything? You know, whispers in the wind. Could we see something like that in the next couple of years, or is no no one talking about it? Well, I really haven't heard much about it um, with as far as the LPG is concerned. So uh, I I would just be guessing, and I don't like to do that. Understand, Jane. I want to go back to the early part of your career. After you graduated from Rollins College, you got your history degree, you spend a year as a teacher, and I read that you borrowed money to go back from New Hampshire down to Florida to work with Bob Toski. Talk about uh, what got you to give golf a, uh, a full go. <laughs> well, it's one, you know, one of the great memories of my life. Um, I was teaching school, but I was making, you know, like $14 a day, and I worked as a waitress at night to enhance my income. And it was actually uh, my mother who pulled me aside. And, uh, you know, she said, you know, you've got some talent. You won some things locally, but you don't want to ever go through life without um, saying what if. 
And so I tried to eliminate the what if, and she said, so I just, um, I want Bob Lewis, who was actually, uh, we lost him. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was, um, you know, won the national amateur. He was a uh, Walker Cup captain, close friend of mine at Rollins College, and he encouraged me to go to Bob Toskey, but I really couldn't afford it. So uh, uh, my mother gave me a couple hundred dollars to, to get in a car and go to Florida, which you could. Gas prices were a little different at that time. And uh, met Bob Toskey, and uh, I remember paying $15 for a lesson. He said, you need more, and I said, I can't afford it. And then all of a sudden, I had a job. I uh, had to go back to New Hampshire, and uh, I quit my teaching job, you know, with notice, of course. And then um, I was Ocean Reef Club in North Key Largo, which at that time, it was a very low-key um, facility. Now it's like this, it's just a fabulous place with three or four golf courses and, you know, accommodations galore. And um, it was through Bob that um, he spent time with me. I did some exhibitions with him, uh, some clinics with him, and uh, he he attracted a lot of the top, both PGA and LPGA professionals. And uh, that's how I honed my game. And that's how I learned my skills. And Jane, going back to the 70s and 80s, you ladies were traveling around together from city to city. I believe you had to pull each other along, help each other out because prize money certainly wasn't a lot back in those days. And then who had kids and other things going on. Talk about what it was like, not on the course, but away from the course on the LPGA Tour as you guys were building up the brand and the tour back in the 70s and 80s. Well, I think when I think back, I just laugh. You know, I, I've i never been one to think, oh, gosh, we, you know, look at the money they have now, which is fabulous. And I, no one could be more excited than I am. But you know, we had so much fun. You know, we caravan together. We drive and we, you know, we'd have a cooler of beer on the other side of the car because then you could. <laughs> <laughs> Life was a little easier then. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, nighttime we played trivial, trivial pursuit. Um, we played softball games. I mean, we, we just had outside of the game of golf. Um, we, we had a lot of fun. There was a concert in town. We would go. We were in a city that had a, hosted a ballpark. We would go to those games. And we just had uh, a lot of activities outside of the game, but uh, kind of the caravanning following from, you know, you could have seven or eight cars trying to keep up with each other. And uh, it was just the uh, I can, camaraderie is the only word that I can really think of. So we had a lot of fun. And at that time, um, we didn't think it was small money because it's all relative to us. It was big money, but the friendships um, uh, live on. And I think, uh, and when we chat, I forget about oh, tournaments I won or, you know, how I played. I think about the experiences and cherish th those, you know, those thoughts. Yeah, to that end, when you get back together on the on the Legends Tour and you, and you see your old peers again, what's it like, you know, conversations and things like that when you're sitting around the table, talk about over a beer, that sort of thing. <laughs> What are some of the things that you guys laugh and enjoy, you know, recounting for what you guys did back in the day? Well, we do we do tell those stories. We rehash them, and they probably get better and better, like the old fish <laughs> stories. But I think the key is that we all sit together and talk. And, uh, you know, now the current LPJ, I mean, the money is fabulous. But the events I have attended, it's the players sit with their parents, with their coaches, with their sports psychologists, <clears throat> with their, you know, PT people. It's um, So it's an entourage, and they're kind of losing that sense of community. And, uh, you know, we make fun of each other, and we laugh. You know, the, <laughs> the golf swings maybe aren't quite as pure. The swings a little bit shorter. Um, <clears throat> the legs aren't quite as attractive. Um, but the <laughs> mannerisms don't change. And, oh, we, we mean, we, we just we, we laugh hilariously at um, at ourselves and uh, really enjoy playing with each other, you know, having, you know, a little action when we play. And um, <laughs> so it was just, uh, believe me, we the stories are, are, are just are so much fun. To that end, do you think you guys actually enjoyed each other and the game back then more 
than what the ladies feel like uh, playing out on the LPGA tour now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a different, you know, it's such a big business now. I mean, to us, it was business then. You mentioned winning the first Diners Tour. You know, that was a hundred thousand dollar purse. That was five times larger than any other. So that was huge. Um, but we still spoke with each other. We helped each other on the range. We didn't have all of our coaches traveling. We went and we didn't travel net jets, you know, so we did the caravan. <laughs> and so, you know, we would, we would help each other with their putting, with their chipping, with their, you know, with their golf swings. And even we played together. And, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, this doesn't mean we weren't competitive. We wanted to beat each other uh, anytime we were in contention. But um, when the round was over, we would always go somewhere to celebrate. And one thing I want to mention, too, when, you know, I was very involved with the, with the now legends of the LPGA in the early stages, in the formative years. And we had a rule. Whoever won the tournament had to buy every everyone who stayed dinner. And so wow. you might win, you know, so someone, uh, you know, I remember Rosie Jones won a tournament in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, she won 20000 Well, it cost her 1000 to buy dinner for everybody who stayed. <laughs> <laughs> but th- those, those are the things that are really, uh, that we have, you know, are so special. And that's something that was important to me to perpetuate. You mentioned a moment ago you had a little action sometimes. Talk about what was some of the action that was out there when you guys were playing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like to play a practice round was so boring. So you had to, the way to really prepare for a tournament was to make sure a shot counted. Um, so you're not just aiming for something and trying and hitting it again. So, you know, we'd have a, you know, little for birdies and, you know, NASA and team events and, uh, Cindy Rarick and Jan Stevenson were two of my favorites to, uh, you know, to play with. Cindy was very good. She was very difficult to beat when it came down to any money on the line. Now, she didn't win a lot of tournaments, but she would win the practice round. <laughs> and Jane, one of the things that I think is so great about the Legends Tour is the access to the players. If you want to get near a great player, one of the greatest players of all time. The place to do that is with the legends of the LPGA. Talk about the unprecedented level of access people can get when they attend one of the tournaments. Oh, thank you. That was so important to us in the beginning. Um, So we don't gallery rope. I mean, there are a few areas roped off that are sensitive to the course or where you want to, you know, the first tee may be 18 green. But we want people to get up close and personal. Um, I mentioned we had our BJ's team at the Annika played in that last year. And so we can imagine we had huge crowds, but they're just surrounding her. And, uh, it was like the old days. And it just, um, it, it just makes it more fun because we're not just selling skill. We're selling it's entertainment. You know, it's sports and entertainment. And these, the, the women on Legends Tour, um, they're not going to hit the ball as far as Nellie Corda. Um, but they're going to make, they're going to really, they're going to teach you a lot. You're going to watch them. You're going to enjoy them. They're going to, uh, have engage in conversation with you. Um, they're demonstrative and the team event is fun because that's what people do. Normal people do on a weekend. You know, you have, you know, the foursome and two against two. And so everyone can relate to that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a very important component of what we do. And Jane, you mentioned Annika, and she came out of retirement last year and won the U.S. Senior Women's Open. She's set to play again this week in the U.S. Women's Open. Talk about the impact of having her back out there and playing last year with the Legends and now again on the LPGA Tour. Oh, it was huge. You know, the fact that um, – and, and she didn't just didn't play in a Legends event. She said, what can I do to help? I mean, she definitely, she wants to, her, her kids are a little bit older now. And so she has, um, she certainly has done very well with her brand and her businesses and her foundation, et cetera. But um, nothing can ever take the place of competing because that's what made her. And so you can be successful in every other arena, but it's the core. What's imp- What's in your heart? What's important to you? So I think it's great that she realized that and she com- she came back out and boy, she you know that when the senior opened last year, she took it by storm. 
and she's played in a couple of those celebrity events and done very well. So she's staying very competitive. So it will be uh, um, great ball striker savvy. Um, so I wouldn't count her out. I'm not going to say I think she's going to be a, a contender, <laughs> they say, <laughs> from Marlon Brando. But um, I, I think she definitely will hold her own, and uh, we just hope she'll play in a lot of our um, a lot of our LPGA Legends event. And then Kari Webb's up next, so uh, you know I think Kari will be joining us in a few events next year. Jane, before I let you go, and we've talked about the Senior LPGA Championship, you talked about the Land of Lakes Legends Classic and the BGA's charity event. Talk about what you've got coming up later on this summer that we haven't spoken about already. Uh, gosh, I mean, I think as far as legends are concerned, we got a few irons in the fire. Uh, we're talking to some folks down at Port St. Lucie, Florida, uh, next year, which is the home where Mickey Wright resided. Um, you know, the golf course where she lived on the golf course. We hope we get something going there. But I said most of my time now outside of uh, playing in two of the events, I'm not playing in the senior LCG. I'm not quite ready. Um, but I'll be ready for August in Minneapolis, the Land of Lakes and the BJs. And uh, it's really focusing on our women's PGA golf clinics. Um, that's my, you know, kind of creation. And, uh, it's, it, you know, it's positively impact so many lives of women, particularly uh, women in business. Jane, let our listeners know as well, how can we stay up to date with all the great things you're doing in the Legends Tour is up to how can we follow it online and on social media? Well, legends of the LPGA.com. All the information and the women's PGA clinics.com. Jane, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your very busy schedule to come back and be a part of the show. Like I said in your intro, you've become one of my very favorites. You're so much fun to have as part of the show. I thank you for being here and I'm, all, I'm already looking forward to the next time I get to talk to you. Oh, me too. It's always a pleasure. You do your homework. <laughs> I appreciate you. Jay, take care. All the best, my friend. We'll catch up again soon. Okay. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. That's the great Jane Blaylock. Again, the PGA Women's Clinics, and you can find it online at P womenspgaclinics.com. Uh, she's just a wonderful lady, and there's just no two ways about it, and one of the greats of all time of the game. And that's one of the things that I'm glad we got to talk about is if you want to get up close and personal, if you will, with a legend of the game, when you go to one of the LPGA Legends events, there's no ropes. You walk right down the fairway, old lady. So you get unprecedented you know, levels of access with them. You can ask them questions. You can watch how they prepare. You can talk, you know, listen in as they have the conversations with their caddies, talk strategy, clubs, all that stuff that we would never get, whether it's on a Champions Tour or a PGA Tour or the LPGA Tour. You can hear all of those things from these great players. So I highly encourage you, make sure you check out their website and then give them a follow online and on social media as well. Before I get to my next guest, Tom Patry, I want to talk to you about our friends over at Adele Golf. Have you been custom fit for your putter or even for your wedges? Adele Golf is the industry leader in scoring club fitting. Their putter fitting system is the most complete putter fitting system in golf. The EAS line of putters can get your putting dialed in. Also check out their swing match system wedges with weight adjustability to make sure your wedges are truly fit to your swing. Go to adelgolf.com and schedule your fitting today. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Squares Golf. Are you like me, always considering new golf equipment, maybe a new driver? Well, let me reset your thinking because I discovered Squares Golf Shoes. The patented Squares Toe provides balance, stability, and a wider base for increased connection to the ground, effectively increasing your swing speed by 2.2 miles per hour and an average of 9 yards of distance. Independent testing proves it. That's right. It's proven in science. Go to squares.com, get the Squares 30-day money-back guarantee, and use promo code DISTANCE to get $20 off. Remember, distance comes from swing speed, and swing speed comes from your connection to the ground. Squares, the distance golf shoe. All right, now back with me is our resident director of instruction, Tom Patrick. Tom is back up in Charlottesville, Virginia for his second year at Farmington Country Club. 
So if you're in Virginia, West Virginia, or the Washington, D.C. areas, go see Tom there and take your game to a whole new level this summer, folks. If you can't go see him in person, download the V1 video app and send Tom videos of your golf swing. He can help get you dialed in through the app. Please check out his website, TomPatry.com, and give him a follow on Twitter and Instagram, at TomPatryGolf. Don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel, where you can watch nearly 150 free video playing lessons. Tom is also a member of the Titleist Leadership Advisory Board, and he's back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, TP, how are you, my friend? Christy, boy! <laughs> There we go. Tom, how are you? Sitting here, Chris, at the, in my apartment in Farmington and, uh, in Charlottesville, and I'm watching your favorite team, the Yankees, oh, just geez. thrash the California Angels. <laughs> thrash them. Yeah, that's nice. Good for you. Glad I'm not watching. I'm sure, I'm sure, you, you're, I'm sure you're tuned in while you're doing the show, right? Aren't yeah, you? you know me. I'm What a Yankee fan I am. Go Red Sox. <laughs> Tom, we haven't spoken since the PGA Championship, and uh, I want to get your thoughts on what we saw there. I always hate when a tournament is more lost than won. What are your thoughts about what happened to Mito Pereira down the stretch and how the tournament ended up? Well, not, not only Mito, but how about, how about uh, Mr. Young on 16 with the double, and, and then Mito obviously made that terrible swing off the 18th tee. It looked like it looked like me on, on 18, <laughs> gagging and just make, making a wild looking thrash at it out the right field there and just make a double. Just uh you know, I mean we we, we kinda of texted back and forth you and I earlier today, Chris, did, did you know, did did J T win it, did Mito lose it, what happened? Well it was a combination of both really, but you can't you can't uh, take away from how well Justin Thomas played the last day, but certainly you know, that, that, that young South American was in control stand on AT and T just has to put the bat on the ball and get it in play and finish the hole and he wins a major it's you know you hate to see that happen to a young guy like that you hate to see it happen to anybody because if you're a professional you've been there yourself you've had those experiences it's it's not something that goes away very easily so to that point tom does it take any of the shine off jt's win that he didn't actually go out and win it it more fell to him or does the fact that he ended up in a playoff so he still had to win it on some level he he and will zalatoris go at it does that make it feel no, I better? I, I don't think it takes anything away because, you know, it's a 72-hole golf term. You have to finish all 72 holes, you know, and Emilio finished 71 holes. He didn't finish 72, and JT finished 72 plus some. So I don't think it takes anything away. Um, it certainly, it certainly uh, you know, he played marvelous golf the last day, you know, shot a nice score the last day, and then and played unbelievable in the, in, in the three-hole aggregate, you know, you know, played a two-under. So, you know, he, he won the golf tournament, but, uh, there's always going to be that little asterisk next to, uh, next to the finish of that event or any event like that when somebody stumbles that badly coming in. Tom, Tiger made the cut just like he did at the Masters, but also like he did at Augusta. His third round was about as bad as we've seen Tiger play at any point in his career. He shot 79. And if it wasn't for a nearly 40 foot birdie putt late in the last round or his third round, because obviously he withdrew. But if it wasn't for that birdie putt, he shoots 80. He was clearly in a lot of pain walking both at Augusta National and Southern Hills. We've got the Country Club outside of Boston coming up in a few weeks for the U.S. Open. So more hills. What are your thoughts on where and when Tiger should try to tee it up again? You know, Chris, well, we talked about this last time a little bit. Every time I, anytime any of us, you know, you know, put him for dead, Comes up, he comes back and pulls a rabbit out of the hat. But we've seen two events now in a row where he really, really struggled physically. Um, it's um, it's almost it's almost hard to watch if you if you're in the business yeah. and, and you're and you're close and you're close to the business. It's uh, it's it's not it's really you know and and I've been I've been on the tiger wagon and off the tiger wagon in my in my time, um, and you're almost on the wagon and it's not just pulling from just for that one more. Yeah, you know, one more shining moment, but it sure is hard to watch, and 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 I just don't see him physically get much better. He uh, seems like he's in incredible pain at times. Um, you got to admire him for wanting to try and go out there and gut it out, but I don't, I don't see it, Chris. I mean, I, I don't see 
the country. I played the country club. I don't see that as a as a particularly easy walk necessarily. Um, and, and then you know we all look at St Andrews as being a much flatter venue, um, and hopefully in somewhat cooler temperatures, and maybe it makes more sense. But I, I don't know how competitive it really is because we haven't seen we haven't seen any real real competitive golf out of out of him yet this year. Tom, switching over to the Champions Tour, Stephen Alker has gone from a guy who was going through Monday qualifiers just to get a spot in tournaments to being a guy who has now won three times since the beginning of April, including the Senior PGA Championship this past weekend. He's won three of his last five events, and then the other two, oh, by the way, he finished second and third. He's becoming a heck of a player out there. Yeah, it's, it's incredible how some of these guys who turned 50 um, – who were listen? He, he's, he's always been a good player, but he's never been a great player. Um, and, and he's he's been kind of a journeyman in the, go- in the game. He's played, you know, a lot of places all over the world, scratching and clawing at the game. And all of a sudden, he turned fifty, and and you have this incredibly miraculous run. We've seen, you know, he go way way back. Uh, maybe you're too young. There's a guy named Jim Alvis, who's a club pro in Long Island, who. You know, won a senior major and was out there. Larry Reddy won the U.S. Senior Open, had never won a, never won an event as a club pro in the Met section and wins the U.S. Senior Open. Uh, you know, Scott Perrell was working for UPS and you now Stephen Alker comes along and is playing some incredibly beautiful golf. Um, it, it's like you give these guys a second chance. Doug Barron, same situation, perennial mini tour player, really, with a couple of little spins here and on the PGA tour, but no success. And now one a couple of times out there. It's what makes the senior tour so much fun to watch. I mean, I, I think it makes, you know, you, you know, we, we know about Freddie Couples. We know about Bernard Langer. We know about guys who are, you know, household names, but these other guys that pop up some great, great storylines, man. And, and just play, all is playing just wonderful golf right now. Tom, switching gears a little bit. One of the things I've always wondered about with respect to putting is Jack Nicholas may be the best putter of all time. He locks his wrist and pulls the putter straight back and then pushes the ball essentially down the target line. Yet you never see anyone copy his putting style. Why do you think that is? You know, Chris, you know, if you and I went to a PGA Tour event tomorrow and we go on a practice screen, we, you know, the, the worst putter on the PGA Tour is better than the best putter in any club I've ever worked. And, and people, you know, criticize, you know, Freddie's not a very good putter, or, or this guy's not a good putter on tour. And I kind of laugh at that because the worst putter on the PGA Tour is, is better than the best putter at any country club in this country. Um, you know, and they're all, we walked down the street here, we stood on the putting green, we'd see so many different styles, you know, so many different things going on cross handed, claw grip, pencil grip, you know, uh, arm lock. You know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like there's a, it's like, you know, a variety pack out there now where it used to be very, very standard, very, very traditional. That's all changed. It's like flavor of the week. Um, Jack definitely had a unique style. You know, he got very open. His head was way behind the golf ball. Um, and, and like you said, kind of felt like he was pushing it down the target line. Um, Gary kind of was a pop stroke. Arnold was very knock kneed. Uh, Casper was very risky. You know, it, it's a very individual part of the game. It's a very, very feel sensitive part of the game, and you got to find out what works for you. The thing that really puzzles me, Chris, more than anything, is we go back to that great year, several years back, that Jordan Spieth had. We all remember that he hit a lot of putts, you know, looking at the hole, and he putted beautifully that year, and he was spectacular from ten feet and in, spectacular, uh, and looking at the hole. And he's gone away from that, and he's never gone back to it. How do you, how do you have that kind of success with a method, and just abandon it and never go back there and, and do that again? I don't understand that at all. Maybe you can explain that to me. <laughs> no, because that's the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Because to your point, back in 2015, he made everything he looked at, particularly everything. from inside of everything. 20 feet. And now we're all nervous if he's got a one footer let alone a 20-footer. Yeah. I mean, this season, he's 173rd in shots gained putting. In 2015, he was second. If he's your student, what are you telling him? Well, if, he, if, he's, your, if he's my student, Kristen, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I don't want to, you know, listen, he's got a coach, 
and and you got to be very careful as, as a as a person in this business not to inflict or or contradict or criticize other coaches because obviously he's a very talented kid and, and, and Cameron McCormick has done a great job with him. But I don't understand for the life of me how you don't sit down and look at film from 2015. And, and you know what's really amazing, Chris? You still see him make 20 and 30 footers. But to your point, ten feet and in, it, 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 it's 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 you know, I almost have to turn my head away. It's scary. It's scary sometimes to watch what he he does. And like you said, particularly two and three footers, awful. And those were the putts he was making all the time. Those 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 short expectation putts he was making all the time, looking at the pole. So you don't go back to 2015, look at the film and say, Hey, how do I get away from that? Why, why don't I go back there? Because I was really good at that, and that was like rock solid. I, I don't understand. I don't. I don't get it. I I really don't get it at all. Tom, I want to go back to your playing career in the seventies and eighties when you were in college. Why would you? And... Why, would you why would you? Why would you possibly do that? <laughs> so I don't want to talk about how well you played, but I want to talk about one of the things that we we talk about a lot on this show and and around the in the industry is. We talk about the golf ball and advances in technology and the equipment and that sort of thing. But one of the things we don't talk enough about is how the course conditions were different then to now. Oh Gary, players come oh on this God. show and even talked about it at Augusta National, where we think everything has always been beautiful and perfect. But he talked about how bumpy the greens were and how long the grass was on the greens and that sort of thing. Talk about what the playing conditions were like that you saw and you played on in the 70s and 80s versus what you see course conditions playing like now? Well, Chris, it, it, it's it's hard to explain to somebody today, like one of my college kids today, one of my really good junior players, or even my, my you know, my I have a kid on the Latin American tour right now, my corn fairy type guys. It's so hard to explain to these youngsters how much better the agronomy is from T to green, and especially on green. I'll tell you what, how about bunker conditions? How about fringe, how about fringe grass? How about, how about tight runoff areas around the green where you can now putt almost from anywhere at times, uh, put a putter in your hand if you want to. Um, it, it's, it's so hard to explain to people today, especially the competitive players say, how, and we, and by the way, Chris, we didn't think back then that it was crappy. We, we thought it was great back then. In respect to other places, you know, we played in some conditions that today would be unacceptable. That today, in that day, was was fine. It was great. That's all we knew, you know. But when you compare apples to apples from today back to, let's say, my senior year in college when I won my NCAA, uh, and the conditions we played in, it's it's not even close. And 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 I'll tell you what, you put that together with the golf ball. You get the events in, in shafts and club heads and, and club design. The golf ball and the putting surfaces change the whole playing field. Everything's radically different, radically. Um, you know, and, and I, and I always fancy myself as a pretty good competitive putter, but you know, I, I and I try to work every day. I go out and putt every day. Chris now at work before, after I, after my lessons, uh, and Farmington just built a brand new monstrous monstrous practice green it's probably an acre in size it's just a fun like like kind of like what they did at pinehurst and it's in great condition not good just great condition and i was out there putting this evening and i was kind of thinking about what you just asked me this thing was so smooth and and, and so perfect you just felt like you could roll the ball in the hole every time if you did something it was an accident it didn't go in um we've, we've come late years it's incredible it's incredible and one of the things you made mention of, Tom, is bunker play, right? Because back in the day, there wasn't always a rake. It was you, you slid your shoe across, your spikes across the ground to rake the bunkers, right? And a lot of times now, guys would prefer to be in a bunker versus somewhere off the green. But talk about that a little bit. Well, it's funny. You know, a lot of, a lot of my kids say to me, you know, I got this bad line in the third round. I got this bad line in the bunker. I said, you're not entitled to a good lie in a hazard. You know, <laughs> nobody said you're entitled to a good lie in a hazard. So stop bitching. I mean, <laughs> y- 
you know, I remember getting in some bunkers, you know, it, it, during my college golf days, and there weren't a lot of rakes on the golf course, and you'd smooth the rake out with your, with like you said, with your footer, with your club coming out of the bunker, uh, and conditions were less than pristine, but you never thought twice about it because, again, we never thought you were entitled to a good lie in a bunker. You walk in bunkers now, and very rarely isn't the condition of the bunker and the sand, type of sand, uh, just absolutely perfect. It, you know, and I, I like it in bunker shot. I've always liked it in bunker shot, the creativity of it. And it kind of goes back to my time I spent with Chevy, but it, it just seems like it's so much easier now to hit a bunker shot to me. And then you, you get the advent of the, of the, of the sand wedge and the advancement, the advancement in the grinds and the, the bounces and things like that. The, the addition of six degrees loft or more. Um, in comparison to, you know, what we played with, you couldn't get a wedge that had any more off than 55 degrees on it. And the, and the bounce configurations were so, so, you know, old schoolish or, or antiquated by today's standards. Um, so much easier. It's not even funny. It's not even funny. So let's take that a, a step further, Tom. We all, all like to argue about who the greatest player is of all time, and typically that comes down between Tiger and Jack. But if Jack had the course conditions, the equipment, the golf ball, all those things of today, how many of those 19 seconds become a first? Well, I mean, Jack's record was second place finishes. First is of God. I mean, people talk about, you know, Tiger's majors and chasing Jack. Uh, and certainly we're taking nothing away from Tiger. I think he's the greatest player that walked on the planet. But in terms of major record, not only is Jack ahead of him in wins, but second place finishes, Tiger isn't even on the radar screen compared to Jack. Uh, it's unbelievable how many seconds, thirds, fourths, and top fives Jack Nicholas had majors. I mean, and how many more with one roll of the golf ball, you know, and once with a hole, he would have won. I mean, it's insane, absolutely insane what the guy did, you know, major in and major out during his career. Um, he just, just a phenomenal record. He doesn't get enough credit uh, in this discussion for those top fives. And in particular, like you said, Chris, great point on your part. Once again, Chris Mascaro does his homework. The second place finishes are off the chart. Tom, speaking of bunkers, I want to go back and I want to get a playing lesson from you about how to hit a good fairway bunker shot. So let's let's say we're we're somewhere north of 130 yards out and we need to hit a good bunker shot. How do we how do we set up? How do we hit that so we either don't chunk it and it barely gets out or we end up thinning it and leaving it in the bunker because we hit the lip. Chris Chris, do you have Venmo? I do. Hey, just just send me just send me some more <laughs> and get this, get this right over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Chris, it's funny. Someone said you're a top shot. instructor, and occasionally we like to get tips on this show. Maybe you've heard that. I don't know. <laughs> you know, fairway bunker shots serve two purposes in my teaching. One, to learn how to hit a fairway bunker shot. But the guy who has trouble in his iron game in general and hitting the low point in the golf swing, you know, the low point, I take him into a fairway bunker all the time as a drill, because if you can hit a fairway bunker shot correctly, you can be a better iron player on grass. So people who don't hit good fairway bunker shots tend to move around too much, move off the ball, move out of center. They try to swing too aggressively and get out of tempo. Um, they don't have a lot of stability in their footwork. So to hit a good bunker shot, you've got to be very stable in your base. Okay, you've got to stay very, very centered, and you got to get the club to find the low point every time which is the number one thing, I think, in hitting good shots. People say to me all the time, does, does, does contact come first or does direction come first? Well, contact comes first because without contact, you can't control direction. People say, well, I went a little bit right, I went a little bit left. I said, well, how was contact? He goes, well, it was a little bit off. Well, of course it was a little bit off. Because if you can't hit the center of the club face, you can't control the golf ball. So when you get in a fairway bunker, you know, First thing, you have to evaluate the lie, but you have to have stable footing. So I like my people to get their feet in the sand or get dug in just a little bit. And depending on how much you dig in, you know, in other words, you lower your center, you have to choke down on the club a little bit, both to accommodate 
that change in level between you, your body, and where the club's going to bottom out. So choke down. The other thing choking down the club does gives you a little bit more control of the club thing. And then in making the golf swing, you know, if, if the lip is not a factor, if the lip is not a factor, I try to take a little bit more golf club and make a little bit more controlled golf swing and tempo golf swing. And last but not least, and probably the most important, you want to stay very centered when you're making your motion. Tom, a little bit later on tonight, our mutual friend Damon Hack will be back on the show. I know you do some work with Damon on his golf swing. Talk about him. Damon Hack is probably one of the finest gentlemen I've ever met in my journey, Chris. Um, We've become good friends. He came to a mutual friend of both yours and mine, a good friend of mine, Bob Ford. Uh, Damon tells the story that he played Oakmont with a member in his early golf career, and he was, uh, by admission, uh, less than stellar. And he had lunch with Bob Ford at Oakland after the round and, you know, was, you know, hemming and hawing about, you know, wanting to get better. And Ford, he asked him where he lived. He said he lived in New York. And Ford recommended he came, came, come to see me at the time at Friar's Head, and he did. And we've been good friends ever since. And one of the finest gentlemen, as you know, Chris, you're ever going to meet, and the guy who is a golf addict. Absolutely has drank the Kool-Aid big time uh, and fallen in love with the sport, which is so much fun as a teacher when you have a student that's that passionate about getting better and loves it that much. Um, it's it's so much more fun for, for the teacher. But uh, another guy, just like yourself, Chris, who I think really does his homework, he's a bright guy, he's an articulate guy, his background as, as a journalist shines through in everything he does. He's a detailed guy. Um, and, and one of my all-time favorites, as you are. So, I mean, what a great combination for the show tonight to have two guys as talented as you two on at the same time talking about the sport we love. I appreciate that very much. TP, before I let you go, remind our listeners again how they can stay up to date with all the great things you're doing and come see you this summer uh, where you're located up there in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Chris, so all my information is on uh, is at TomPatry.com, my website, and then Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and then that YouTube channel has just been been a lot of fun. It's been, I've been growing up and exploding a little bit. I got, I think, like you said, 100, about 150 videos on there now. We're about to film a bunch more this summer uh, to add to that list. Uh, so that's been fun. Um, but more importantly, and I always do this, I try to do whatever I remember, and I try to never forget this. Everybody out there listening, we should be thanking you, not you thanking us, pal, because you do a hell of a job. You're my favorite talk on on, on the air. Um, you do your homework. You're you're one of all of us who come on and, and we commiserate when we're off. And behind your back, we talk about you only only with <laughs> reverence, pal. You're 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 so good at what you do, and, and we really enjoy being a part of your show. I love you, my friend. I can't thank you enough for coming back and being a part of the show. Look forward to catching up with you again in a couple of weeks. In between now and then, stay safe. Hey, Chris, make sure you tell Hack I said hi. I will absolutely do it. TP, I love you, Thanks, my friend. Hi. Take care. We'll catch up soon. Bye, buddy. God See God. you, man. That is the great Tom Patry. Follow him on social media at Tom Patry Golf, and then on his website, like he said, TomPatry.com. Great stuff. And then that YouTube channel, folks. I went out there before I went to Macklemore, looked at a whole bunch of them. And fortunately for, for my score, I did kind of got out. Like I say, got a little sketchy front nine. But, you know, as I started to slow my mind down and think back to some of the videos that Tom had and, uh, you know, kind of adjusted my grip a little bit, kind of adjusted some of my swing tempo a little bit, really used that. And he talked about it again tonight. Kind of clubbed, you know, clubbed up a little bit, but, you know, got my swing instead of going all out, doing a kind of a three quarter swing so I could control the golf ball in myself a little bit better. That made all the difference over the last 27 holes. So I, like I said at the top of the show, thank you, Tom Patrick, for helping me uh, from a strategy perspective, uh, play some of my best golf over 27 holes over the last few years. Love TP. He'll be back with us again in a few weeks. Before I get to my next guest, Jeff Tracy, I want to remind you about a couple of our sponsors, starting with our friends over at Two Under. Two Under Men's Performance Briefs have just released their new Spring and Summer 22 collections with fun, new, and exciting prints like the Freedom 2 and 3, Santa Fe, Tigers, 
zebras, and duckies. And their new exclusive Folds of Honor collection, where they donate 20% of all Folds of Honor sales proceeds to that cause. The patented Joey Pouch technology delivers maximum comfort, fit, and performance while preventing any unwanted skin-on-skin contact or chafing. Good for anything from the golf course, to the boardroom, to the bedroom. You can find these two underperformance briefs in over 4,000 golf pro shops nationwide, all Shields sports stores, all PGA Tour superstores, Golf Galaxy, Dillard's, and other fine retailers near you. You can also order them online at twounder.com. That's the number two, U-N-D-R.com. Two under, performance in your pants. Use code NEXTT20, that's N-X-T-T-E-E-20, for a 20% discount on the Two Under website. Also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Golf Pride. In golf, light grip pressure releases power. Golf Pride engineered a secret the pros know. A larger lower hand encourages lighter pressure. Plus 4 technology is designed with four additional layers, which reduces tension in the lower hand to generate more power. Play Plus 4 and release the secret the pros know. Now available on Tour Velvet, the winningest grip on Tour. Grip confidence, grip Golf Pride. Okay, now next on the tee with me is Jeff Tracy. Like Tucker Booth, who joined me on the bonus edition of the show a couple of days ago, Jeff is another great friend that I've gotten to know over Twitter. He was kind enough to ask me to be a guest on his great show, Grilling at the Green, a few months ago. We had a lot of fun, so I wanted to get Jeff to join me over here on this show. You can hear him and the Grilling at the Green show, plus his other show, Barbecue Nation, on AM860 up in Portland, Oregon, as well as on Amazon Music. Check him out online at thecowboycook.com. And I'm very excited Jeff is with me and next on the tee. Hey, Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm fantastic, Jeff. How are you? (laughs) (laughs) I'm good. But I am going to, I'm going to throw something out here for you real quick. Okay. Uh Oh, Oh, now calm down. (laughs) Um, I, I, I think that all the comparisons between Tiger and Jack are kind of like comparing apples and oranges. Ooh, why? That's just my thought. Why? They played at different times under different course conditions, under different equipment. Um, you know, Tiger took it to a different level with his uh, exercise res- regimen. And, you know, there's, there's so many variables. And trying to compare the two. I mean, if you, if it's kind of like trying to compare really classic cars, and I'm not even a car guy, but you know, if you went back and tried to, uh, compare the first model of the Mustang, which is now highly thought of and all that stuff, and then try to compare it to, uh, the latest Porsche Carrera or something. I mean, you know, they're just different. They're just different. That's the way I look at it. Uh, I'm an unabashed Tiger fan when I was younger. Um, you know, at the age of two, I was, uh, always watched Jack on, you know, on the golf on the weekends and stuff. My family didn't like golf, but I did. And so I just always think that comparing the two, it's, it makes for great conversation. But I think kind of when you boil it down, they're, they're two completely different styles of play. And, um, you know, Tiger's putting prowess when he was in his prime and all that stuff. I just, I, I always get a kick out of listening to people like that. I was listening to you when I was in the green room, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, I, I have I have no problem with it, but I just think, you know, if you really look at it logically, you have to say that there were two different times, two different eras, two different styles, um, you know, comparing majors records. And, of course, that's what we look for in golf is the majors. But I really think it's that's just my opinion. So. And I'll get, you know, 10 million phone calls that say I'm wrong, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's the world we live in now, especially over social media. <laughs> that is very true. And I've got beat up a couple of times over it, but it's okay. I don't mind. They just, uh, you know, they to me, they're just two different, completely different things. Anyway, so how are things in Georgia with you today, my friend? <laughs> they're fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff, I want to go back to... Early on, I guess you would say in your career, you earned your Bachelor of Science degree after attending Oregon State and Cal Poly Pomona, and you've been in the radio industry, I think, for at least 30 years. 
Talk about early. Yeah. Was broadcasting always going to be the thing for you? I thought so. Um, my folks didn't. We had uh, we had property, um, not large amounts, but we were very involved in the horse business. And my my folks had it kind of planned. I was going to be I was going to be a veterinarian and a world class uh, horse guy showing. And and I did a lot of that. And and then a judge and all this stuff. And and boy, but in deep down inside, I'm a big enough ham. Uh, cured and spiral cut, by the way, uh, that, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I always wanted to be in, in, in broadcasting. I always wanted to be on TV and radio. And, um, after I decided not to be a veterinarian, uh, which is a great profession, uh, but it was, I just didn't want to stay in school that long, you know, uh, cause they're very, they go through a similar process, not quite as long as doctors. But anyway, uh, I got out and I did the horse thing. Uh, as a touring pro for a few years and then said, okay, that's enough. And, um, I went back and, and started a radio show. Oh God, way back in like 1990. Uh, I had done radio in college, Chris. I, when I was in LA, I was a morning DJ, uh, drive time DJ on a rock college rock station there. And then, um, anyway, uh, I started a radio show called Horseman's World. Because I knew the topic, and it just kind of went from there. And did I've done five, I think five or six different syndicated radio shows over the years. And um, uh, funny thing was, is I always had something about cooking in all my shows, which you know, Barbecue Nation, of course, that kind of goes without saying. But uh, yeah, I think it was. I, and I started doing television commercials. Um, voicing them and then also um, being a, a principal in them, you know, actually on camera. So I started that way back in the mid eighties. Uh, so anyway, that's how it all happened. And I just kept going I built my own studios and uh, I learned an awful lot. And so if anybody wants to learn what not to do in the radio business, just give me a call. <laughs> so there you go. And if you talk about, I did the horse thing, you traveled the world. Yes. For a while, officiating yes. horse shows, right? Talk about that. Um, I actually, you have to be licensed to do that. There's a, when, when I was younger, it was called the American Horse Show Association, uh, was one of the licensing bodies. And then, of course, there was, uh, American Quarter Horse Association and various breed associations like that. <clears throat> And um, I got my first license when I was a junior in college. I had turned 21 when I was a junior and uh, applied for it and got it and started. And then even after I got out of school and was competing, I still had my licenses. And then it didn't take me too long to figure out it was a lot easier to fly business class somewhere than it was to ride in a big truck with 10 horses. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I... Uh, I kept, I kept doing that and I worked myself up the, the ladder. I mean, you have to, you got to pay your dues and, and things in that world, just like you do in any world. And then I got very fortunate. Um, I've been to, been to Europe and the Middle East, and South America and Australia and of course Canada and Mexico and those places worked in all those places. And, um, uh, I was the first American to judge a show in, uh, the Saudi Arabian national championship years ago. So. It was, uh, I, I had some really good times there. I met a lot of interesting people, got to go places that normally you wouldn't get to go, like Minot, North Dakota. That's a garden spot. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was really good to me. It really was. So, Jeff, you talked about starting to watch golf at a very early age. I think you said two years old. Talk about when you developed your love for the game. I was probably maybe somewhere between eight and ten. Uh, my brother um, had left an old set of golf clubs, and they were old. They came over on the Mayflower uh, in the garage. We called it the woodshed because all us kids spent a lot of time in the woodshed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, um, and they were, they were just beat up, terribly beat up. But I would take the balls uh, and the clubs out in the pastures and, and hit balls. Um, 
And, you know, at that age and that stage and they weren't fit for you or they weren't in very good shape and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, one out of every 50 shots actually got up in the air and, and flew somewhere. And, uh, in living where I lived, there was a limited access to golf balls. So you had to be able to go find them. Anyway, um, that kind of started it. And then there was a little nine hole course not too far from us. And so I would go up there and play. And then what, well, here's something not to do kids. If you're listening to this show, don't try it at home. Uh, if you, when you, when you get your first credit card, the first big thing I went and bought was a set of golf clubs and a really nice bag and all the stuff. And then when the bill came to the family office, I heard about it, but, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was good, but that it truly, and I loved watching it, you know, but those were back in the days that golf wasn't always on CBS or NBC. It was on ABC and we didn't have cable and that, and it was what Shell's wonderful world of golf and, and those kinds of specials. And I would watch them and I would, you know, those for Jack and Arnold and, and, um, you know, Hogan played in a few of those over the years and, and, uh, Sam Snead and, and all those folks. And so they seemed like they were very old to me, but man, did they hit that golf ball. So that's what kind of hooked me on it. And Jeff, you talked about how in your shows, food always seemed to work its way in there. Why? Mm-hmm. I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, I, I, and for just a very, semi-serious moment in competing in all those years that I did. Um, those were very long days and, and all that. And if you've ever been to, uh, you know, a fair or a horse show or a rodeo or anything like that, the food is fun, but it's not really great. And so um, I had this affinity to cook too. And I started cooking when we were, when we would come home from traveling. And I would kind of cook, uh, and I, and it started by me watching a show called The Galloping Gourmet. And, um, that's Graham Kerr, Galloping Gourmet, who's still alive and he's a good friend of mine. He lives up above Seattle now. And he was always this very funny guy. And later I learned that he probably drank a bottle and a half of wine before he went on. And that's why he was so funny, but, but he, he would make these great dishes and long story short, we had uh, my father's sister was staying with us. Her husband passed away. And so if it looked like whatever he was cooking on TV, Chris, if I thought I wanted to take a shot at it, she would write down the recipe and buy all the ingredients. And then the next day when I got home from school, I would try to cook it before I went and did my chores at the barn. You know, and so I would, I would try to do that. And that's really how, what got me interested in cooking too. And, um, that just stayed with me when, when I was in school and stuff, I, you know, and you have your college apartments and, you know, you went to school too. I mean, they're never the sharpest thing. Uh, but as long as they had a stove top or something that you could cook on, I was good to go. And so I just always did that. And then when I, I was in a movie years ago, a couple of them, but one in particular, and I thought, you know, I could, I could dig this movie stuff. <laughs> so I, I would not go up for lunch. I would stay down at the trailer that they called craft services. If everybody knows what that is, craft services prepares the food for people on when they're shooting TV shows or movies or whatever. And I would hang out with those guys. I would hide from our crew commander, and they'd all get on the bus and go up the hill and, and go eat wherever they took them up to the tents or something. And I would stay down below, and I would make sandwiches for the crew or cook them lunch. And while I was doing that, one guy said to me, he goes, man, you should have a cooking show. And so I was like, yeah, why not? I could do this. And so I put together a, a budget, and... We got some money, and I filmed the pilot. And that's another whole long story. Uh, the show didn't go anywhere. They wanted the show, but they didn't want me. Um, so I kept the handle, the cowboy cook, 
and I've been that ever since. Um, and uh, we do, you know, we do barbecue nation, but in the horse shows, I always had the, the, you know, the the um, uh, cowboy cook minute type thing where we did recipes and stuff. And now we do, of course, we do some a little bit of the cooking in the golf show. We do a lot of it in the barbecue show. I cook on television. So that's how it all kind of, it all kind of just melded together. No pun intended, but it, it did. And that's why I've been doing it for a long time. Okay. So you can't mention that you were in a movie or movies without plugging what oh, movie yeah. or movies were you in? Uh, I was in one called The Director, which never saw the light of day. And then another one that uh, you might recognize the name called The Postman with Kevin Cosner. I was one of the bad guys, and um, you wouldn't recognize me because I had very long hair, and we were always dirty, um, intentionally so. And we were <laughs> kind of General Bethlehem's bad guys, and we'd kind of go, you know, burn villages and, and uh, steal from people and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, Will Patton was General Bethlehem, so... I worked on that movie for about nine weeks, I think. And uh, it was good. It was fun. It was a very big learning experience. Um, very big. I was just, you know, eyes wide open in awe. And especially, you know, you walk around the corner and you walk right into Kevin Costner or Rex Lynn or Joe Santos or any of those guys. And they were all very nice, very friendly, very approachable and all that. So I thought, well, why can't I do this? So I did it. <laughs> there, you know, I, I never went to acting school. I never did any of that. I just did it. So there. Uh, I don't know if that's a good answer, Chris, but that's it really is. what happened. All right. So Jeff, a couple more yeah. before I let you go. So I, I gotta get, I gotta understand. Do you get more satisfaction now by going out and playing a great round of golf? Or having a great rack of ribs or other meat turning out perfectly on the grill. Which makes me, which one makes you smile more? Boy, that's a tough one. Although I have more success <laughs> on the grills than I do on the green. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, the, my cooking prowess is pretty good. I'm not being arrogant, but it is pretty good. But, you know, uh, golf is always a work in progress, as you know, Chris. I mean, I'll go out and have a great round and think, man, that's like, you know, that's why I'm doing this. This is great. And then you go back a couple of days later or whenever and you play another round and you go, this is just terrible. This sucks. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> but the ribs always turn out pretty much the same. So, you know, it's all good. So we're on I'll the heels cook, now. I'll have to cook for you some. Yeah, no doubt. Jeff, we're yeah, on the heels of Memorial Day weekend, but we've got the 4th of July coming up before too long, another big grilling day. What's a common mistake mm -hmm. you see from we amateurs when we're when you're uh, when you're going over to a cookout at a friend's house that you, you look and you, you start to shake your head no and makes you want to, you know, all right, let me take over the grill. You're messing this thing up. <laughs> um, well, a couple of things, I think. Uh, they don't have the the, I don't want to say the skills because everybody has the skills, but they don't utilize like digital thermometers and things. And they're guessing if the meat is actually done. Okay. I mean, it's pretty easy to tell if you're, if you're got, uh, corn on the cob or something like that cooking, you can pretty much tell when it's done. But, you know, if you're cooking a big rack of ribs or, uh, tri tips or steaks, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it's probably the biggest thing is that they don't uh, know when it's done, and that and a lot of times they try to cook it too fast, and so you know, bigger pieces of meat, bigger thicker cuts are going to take a little longer. And without getting into a big diatribe here, you usually have a, a hot side of the grill and a cooler side of the grill. It's direct and indirect heat is what we call it, and they and they don't utilize that properly. And so, you know, they get on there and they throw a steak on there and it, you know, they, they go, well, I just do these eight minutes aside or whatever their number is. 
And it's like, well, it doesn't always work that way because not every grill is the same, you know. And so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, the other thing, like with ribs, people tend to either not get them really done, uh, so they're, 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 they're chewy. You know, what, what do you hear, Chris? They say, oh, the meat just fell off the bone. Well, why the heck do you want to cook ribs if you want the meat to fall off the bone? That defeats the purpose, you know. You want to be able to bite into them and enjoy them like that, but you got that bone there for a reason. So, um, <laughs> I, I think those are a couple of things that, that people, it doesn't take much. There's a gazillion YouTube videos on how to, how to do this stuff anymore. And, uh, you know, if you're not really sure, you know, hover in with your, uh, lamp at midnight in front of your computer and, uh, <laughs> you can watch a couple of those and nobody will know you do it and it will, it will help you, you know, cook those things. So. Great advice. If, if, yeah, it's pretty easy, really. But uh it's just paying attention to it. And then the other thing that you see is um, people say, well, I want to make grill marks on my steak. They're pretty, but they don't do much. They don't mean anything, honestly. But they look pretty on the plate. People kind of give you ooh and ah and oogle around on it. doesn't mean that the steak is cooked properly. It just looks pretty. So, um, <laughs> you know. Kind of, kind of, kind of pay attention to that too. Good digital thermometer for twenty bucks will save you a lot of grief. I'll just put it that way. Jeff, before I let you go, let our listeners know how can they stay up to date with the great things you're doing. Follow you on social media and then listen to your shows. Social media. I finally got smart and, and hired a young man to take care of my social media stuff for us. Because uh, man, I was way over my head in some of that stuff. I'm just being honest. But you can find us, uh, you go Barbecue Nation. It's BBQ Nation. Um, our website for that show is bbqnationjt.com. That'll have the last show on it, but it's on all the platforms, you know, from Captivate to Apple to Pandora to Amazon to all those things. You can you can listen to the shows there, or you can go to thecowboycook.com. That usually will tell you kind of where I'm at. That one's actually got recipes on it. And then Grilling at the Green is um, grillingatthegreen.net. And if you just, like, get on Twitter and just in the little search box, type in Grilling at the Green or BBQ Nation, it'll flip them up and show you what the actual little Tweety Bird symbol is for it there. And uh, it's pretty easy. But, we're yeah, we're out there. We're kind of worldwide. And then we have a slew of radio stations that, that play, uh, well, both shows, but barbecue shows much bigger. And they're across the country. And we just signed not long ago with USA Radio Network. Um, they're kind of getting all their stuff together. So um, they'll be publishing probably in a month or so all the affiliate lists and things. So you can find us, find us pretty much everywhere, even if you don't want to. So, <laughs> Jeff, it's been great having you as part of the show, my friend. I can't thank you enough for coming out. Uh, and, and joining me tonight. I hope this is the the first of many times that uh, that you join me. You're fantastic. Well, well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. You're a great guy. I know that when you were on my on the Grilling at the Green show, people really enjoyed that episode. Um, and you're a terrific fellow. Uh, you really are. And to those listening, I'm not saying that just because Chris paid me, but I'm <laughs> telling you, he's a really good guy. So it's I appreciate all good. that. Yeah, I appreciate that very much, my friend. The same right back to you. Look forward to catching up with you again soon, Jeff. All right. You take care. Thank you, everybody. See you, Jeff. That's the great Jeff Tracy. Again, BBQ Nation, thecowboycook.com, grillingatthegreen.net, and you can follow him on Twitter, at HowCook57. You want to talk about great guys. That's a great guy. He's a lot of fun. He's very funny, and he's been uh, a wonderful supporter of the show, and I'm a wonderful supporter of his. Because I think he does such a great job. He's very fun to listen to. He makes the the show so much fun. You you laugh a lot, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the signs of a great show. So looking forward to having Jeff join me again here real soon. Okay, before I get to my next guest, Damon Hack, I want to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors, starting with our friends over at Shrixon Cleveland Golf. Your best performance starts with the right golf ball at Shrixon. 
A global leader in golf ball technology and innovation, Strixon offers a wide variety of award-winning golf balls for golfers of every skill level. Whether you're searching for a tour performance golf ball or a distance golf ball with incredible feel, Strixon provides the best golf balls at incredible prices. Strixon offers a wide variety of personalized options while also developing a highly visible colored golf ball as well. Select the right golf ball for your game today and trust it with Strixon. Check them out online at Strixon.com, S-R-I-X-O-N.com. Find the right golf ball for your game today. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Sun Mountain. There's a company nestled in the valley of Missoula, Montana, that embodies the essence of quality, function, and innovation, and that's Sun Mountain, which started building golf bags back in 1981. They are an industry leader in golf bags, travel covers, outerwear, and push carts. With flagship products that you've come to know, like the C-130 cart bag, the 2.5 ultralight stand bag, the club glider travel cover, the speed cart, and Rainflex rain gear. Sun Mountain continues its quest to provide the very best in golf products to every range of golfer. Visit them online at sunmountaingolf.com to look at their amazing products. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is Golf Channel host Damon Hack. Let me remind you about his background. He's from L.A., He graduated from UCLA with his undergraduate degree in UC Berkeley with his master's degree in journalism. He started out covering the San Francisco 49ers for the Sacramento Bee. In 2000, he moved over to Newsday covering the New York Knicks in golf. In 2002, he joined the New York Times covering golf and the NFL. 2007, he joined Sports Illustrated covering golf and the NFL for them. In 2012, he joined the Golf Channel and is now by far one of the best hosts and interviewers in the business. You can see him hosting Golf Today each day on the Golf Channel. And I'm honored he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Damon, how are you, my friend? Chris, I'm doing great, man. And that's so nice of you to say. Of course, my coach, T.P. Tom Patrick, top 100 teacher who's helped me uh, with my game for many years. And it's a It's a love fest. It's a mutual admiration society. Indeed it is. And when uh, TP was on a little bit earlier tonight, he talked about how back in the day you uh, you got to play Oakmont, which led you to to meeting Bob Ford, which ultimately led you to TP and him helping you with your game. Talk about sort of that sequence of events. Yeah, this would have been like 2008, 2009 or so. I was actually at the Masters Tournament. And uh, a member at Oakmont named Alan Citron, I'm very good friends with him to this day. Um, I did like a little corporate speaking outing, and uh, he liked what I said. I told stories about Tiger and Phil and covering the PGA Tour for the Times. And, and he said, hey, have you ever played Oakmont? And I was like, no, you know, I, I really haven't. I'd love to play it at some point. And yeah, the spot, literally, we exchanged numbers. Come play Oakmont at some point, uh, you know, get to play one of the great gems of of the country, and sure enough, I did. I think I spent a weekend there and got to meet the, the great Bob Ford, who at the time was the head professional at both Seminole and Oakmont, two of the great spots in the country. And I was, uh, you know, as we all are, trying to get a little bit better with my game, a little tighter with my game. I was living in New York at the time, and, you know, it would have been fun to take lessons from Bob Ford, but New York's far away from, from Pittsburgh. I said, so, uh, you know, Mr. Ford living in the New York area, give me a name of someone uh, I should see. And he didn't even hesitate. He said Tom Patrick, who at the time was at Friar's Head and was at Westchester before that. And uh, that's been uh, the beginning of a long and, and great, not just teacher-student relationship, but friendship. We talk a lot about family. We talk a lot about sports and life. And, and uh, whenever I get a chance to be around Tom, um, often in Naples, he really, really helps me with my game. He, leans on me to send him V1 video. He just is, is one of those folks that has seen everything. He's someone who's just given countless hours of lessons. He's seen every swing style, shape, tall players, short players, you know, long in the tooth, newbies, juniors, seniors, you name it, uh, Tom Patry has coached it. So uh, I, I feel very, very blessed and fortunate to have uh, someone of his ilk in my corner. Damon, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to look ahead to this week's tournament at the Memorial. I'm a huge Jack Nicholas fan, and he's come under some scrutiny lately because of his support for Donald Trump and 
being sued by Emigrant Bank, which he sold his publicity rights and trademarks to. Their concern appears to be about anything that Jack would do to damage the Nicholas brand, like if he were to get involved with the Saudi League. We know he said he wouldn't endorse that. But as as a Nicholas fan, for those of us who are, is there anything for us to be concerned when we think about his reputation and the things going on sort of away from the golf course? I don't think so. It's interesting. He had a press conference today in Dublin uh, at the site of his memorial tournament at Muirfield Village and was uh, pretty much right off the bat saying, I'm, I'm here to talk about this week in the golf tournament. I, I think in this era that we live in, is so much strife and folks have been backed in their specific corners politically, you know, someone will tell you that the sky is blue, someone else will tell you that it's green, and I, I think that there's been a, a, a lack and loss of civility, and I think with social media exacerbating things in many situations, I, I think if you got rid of social media, if most people sat around a dinner table and had a conversation, you'd find there's a lot more agreement on issues than disagreement, whether you're talking about politics or life. I think most people just want to have a safe place for their family, and and a good future for their kids. So as far as Jack is concerned, when when I try to cover him and look at him, it's mostly as as the man and his accomplishments on the golf course, his contributions to the game. And I think he tried to keep his press conference very much about the golf course and the tournament this week and folks like John Rahm and Rory McIlroy being in the field. And he kind of refused to to step into anything about the political realm or or the the lawsuit with the Nicholas companies. And listen, if you live long enough, you're going to have, you know, uh, a bit of a paper trail or comments or things that you've said that could come back and and bite you at some point. But I think for most people who are golf fans, they try to look at the the, uh, 73-time PGA Tour winner, the 18-time major champ, the prolific golf course architect, and and someone who uh, the late, great Dave Anderson told me was one of the two best quotes he ever spoke to in sports, the other being Muhammad Ali. So in my time as a journalist, and I've been to, to Jack and Barbara's home and did a feature a long time ago on Barbara uh, for Sports Illustrated magazine, and Jack was sitting with us in the kitchen. Uh, so I've been around him. I've had some terrific interviews with him. And, you know, wherever he sits politically and, and whatever those things are, I, I try to, in my job, in my role as a co-host on, on Golf Today, uh, I, I try to keep it pretty uh, uh, apolitical as much as I can. Are you going to be in Dublin for the memorial? Chris, I've been so often. It's one of my favorite stops. I'm not going this year. It's the opposite the U.S. Women's Open and also the NCAAs. So we've got reporters and cameras kind of spread far and wide. So I won't get the opportunity to go have a Buckeye a milkshake as I have in the past. One of my favorite stops of the year, and you know it's been kind of jacked kind of owed to his childhood where he grew up uh, outside of Columbus, where he used to go hunt for fish and, and, and look for animals. And, of course, also his ode to Augusta National, a lot of the same vibe in terms of the caddy bibs that are white and the reachable risk-reward par fives and just kind of the presentation of the golf course has that bit of a sprinkling and a, and a feel of Augusta National where he won six green jackets. So I won't be there this week, but I've been there. I've had the the opportunity to have lunch in that clubhouse. I've kind of wiled away the hours occasionally when there's been a thunderstorm to pop up from time to time, but I've always enjoyed my time uh, in Dublin. Okay, so you mentioned the milkshake. Got to tell me, which one's your favorite? The Buckeye is great, but I'm kind of a fan of vanilla. Since I was a kid, I, I love French vanilla ice cream, and, and so anytime there's an option, you know, whether it's the Buckeye or if I go into a Baskin Robbins or these days the Ben and Jerry's and I got to choose between the chocolate and the vanilla or the, the mint or the, the bubble gum or the chocolate. I mean, there's all these different kinds of, of ice creams these days and, and, and milkshakes. But if I had to choose, you know, and I could only have one, I felt like I had to try the Buckeye. You're in the Buckeye State, you know, Nicholas went to Ohio State and the Buckeye is a very popular milkshake. But for me and for my dollar, I could have like five or six vanilla milkshakes and be very happy uh, during my week at the Memorial <laughs> Tournament. And Damon, you mentioned John Rahm a minute ago. Patrick Cantlay has officially won two of the last three Memorial Tournaments, but I think we all believe John Rahm would have won it last year if he hadn't been forced to withdraw after the third round due to a, a positive COVID test. He had a six-stroke lead. He would have then won the tournament in back-to-back years a couple of weeks ago. 
He wins the Mexico Open. Is he the favorite coming into this week? Do you like Cantlay? Who's your favorite? Yeah, John Rahm is my favorite. I think the way he handled last year and coming off that 54-hole lead, six shots, and not being able to play that final round, and he goes out two weeks later and wins the U.S. Open. I think a lot of us uh, learned a lot about John Rahm during that two-week stretch. And also, that story seemed to transcend golf. I had some buddies who are kind of loose golf fans that pay attention during the majors. They love how John Rahm handled that situation. Uh, he's a past champ there, would have had two memorial titles that last year turned out differently. I think that he has to be considered the favorite, the way he hits the golf ball, the way he handles par fives. We've seen historically, whether you're talking about Tiger Woods, A, in terms of how he handles that golf course, but you see the, the same names seem to pop up there quite a bit in the past. It would be Ernie Els. These days, it's the Cantleys, the Roms, the Hideki Matsuyamas, Justin Rose as a Terrific record around there as well. I just think John Rahm, uh, considering the win in Mexico earlier this year, considering that we're two weeks away from another major championship, that uh, the way last year ended, it would be almost poetic uh, for he to come back and get a second memorial title this week in Dublin. And, Damon, we're a little over a week north of uh, this year's PGA Championship, and I even think the staunchest Justin Thomas fan would feel badly about how the 72nd hole played out there. What are your thoughts about how Mito Ferreira lost it on the last hole? Yeah, I was so tough to watch. Anyone who's watched major championships knows that it's not over until that 72nd hole. And for whatever reason, seeing Mito, it reminded me of Kenny Perry at the Masters uh, back in 2009, trying to hold off the uh, Angel Cabrera and, and Chad Campbell, you know, that year. Kenny Perry birdied the 16th hole, and then he bogeyed 17 and 18, and he was sitting in uh, the uh, the media center afterwards and just said, you know, maybe I'm not to win, not meant to win this. And talked about his right hand getting a little bit active on some chip shots late on that Sunday afternoon, and it was a reminder to me that man, it is hard to win major championships. And here's Mito with his best friend Joaquin Neiman up on that hill pacing. You know, living and dying with every shot, and there he is on the 72nd hole after leaving that putt on 17, just a half roll short. If that putt falls, he's got a two-shot lead, and maybe he hits iron or three-wood off that tee. Instead, he hits driver, which, you know, he has been hitting that fade all day, and you could see he stepped up there and then hit it pretty quickly, and he immediately recoils, and the ball goes to the right, and he says later, you know, I didn't feel nervous, but pressure – makes your body do things that you don't always expect. And just one of those sad moments and the thing starts speeding up and then, you know, he's hitting three and he, of course, doesn't hit the green and he doesn't hit a good chip shot and he has to hold the fifth and he misses that. It's just, that's just the way golf can be sometimes. It, it can leave you out there like uh, someone who's lost his dog or, or like you've been embarrassed. It's just one of those games. It, it's a beautiful game. I, I love the, I love the, triumph but i also love the heartbreak it's just part of of what makes golf so captivating and compelling good on mito for bouncing back and having a solid week in fort worth at the uh charles Schwab challenge this past week uh, in fort worth texas but man uh, it was very compelling theater a couple sundays ago at southern hills and, and mito joins a long list of you know of, of players whether you're talking about a scott hoke or an ed Seed or a Kenny Perry or or someone else, you know, Greg Norman, of course, was a two-time major champ, uh, had a bunch of Sunday banana peels, as it were, you know, t tournaments that slipped through his fingers. And, you know, we add Mito Pereira to that list, but hopefully young enough in his career, we'll have some other opportunities down the road. Damon, we've seen Tiger try to will his way around Augusta National and then around Southern Hills for the PGA Championship. He does a great job with the mind over pain thing for, for two rounds, but, but then walking on that bad leg up and down the hills at Augusta National, as you know, it's, it's, it's much more undulated, uh, than what TV does justice to. And then we saw it again at Southern Hills. Hard to watch because he's obviously in a lot of pain. The country club outside of Boston isn't going to be any different for the U.S. Open. Do you expect to see him there? Do you think he waits until the Open Championship at St. Andrews because it's a much flatter walker. When do you think we see Tiger Woods again? Yeah, if I was part of Team Tiger, I would advise him, and I'm no doctor. I don't even play one on TV, 
But I, I would tell him to sit it out. I, I just feel like the turnaround's too quick from that PGA Championship. Uh, so strange to see Tiger having to withdraw and not play a final round after making the cut. I just think it's strange to see someone who had such command over not just his own game, but seemingly the golf course and everything around it and the golf course seemed to tilt in whatever direction Tiger wanted it to. And that's just not the terms of the deal anymore uh, with this leg injury that he's having to play through and then rehab and take ice baths and Epsom salts and do whatever else he has to do just to get his body ready to play the next day. I know how much the old course means to him. It's the site of his 2000 and 2005 Open Championship victories. It's the 150th Open. I would be surprised if Tiger did anything to jeopardize him having the best shot to play a very flat golf course where he can hit irons and not have to worry about, you know, trying to hit golf balls off of, you know, uphill, downhill, chewy, you know, meaty, gnarly, a New England lies, as you might find um, in Brookline in a couple of weeks. I just think that for someone who loves and has professed his love for St. Andrews the way that Tiger Woods has, it would be a bit of a risk for him, I think, to try to get ready for a national championship, which is going to ask his body and his game some very difficult questions, and then try to turn around and fly up to the uh, old course and try to compete to win another Claire job. Damon, with all the controversy surrounding Phil Mickelson now, how much permanent damage has been done to he and his reputation? Yeah, I think, I think permanent's a bit strong, considering what uh, Tiger Woods has been able to do. I mean, I was at that Masters tournament. You think about the, the difficulties he's had, some brought on by himself. Well, obviously, the scandal in 2009 and coming back from, you know, less well, you know, worrisome things in terms of a life standpoint, but chipping yips and back surgeries are no small thing either, not to mention this latest car accident. And to see and hear the adulation on a Monday practice round at Augusta where shots were being cheered and, and the applause, uh, the thanks that these gallery members felt, the patrons for Tiger just putting his body back together and the scandal and, and, the, and the occasional um, you know, setbacks seemed to fade into the distance as, as Tiger was being loved and adored and appreciated as opposed to the awe and the kind of distance that Tiger sometimes had uh, with his fans. That being said, I think Phil Mickelson, similarly, he's in a very sticky wicket right now. Uh, some poor choice of words, uh, calling the PGA Tour obnoxiously greedy, uh, considering it has been uh, remarkably good to him, uh, a place for him to apply his trade, win six major championships, be incredibly handsomely paid off the golf course, able to make a, a living and have a private jet, and obviously earn those things, but to hear him Lashed out at the PJ Tour were very, very strange. Some of his comments about Saudi Arabia and knowing the way that the, the regime treats gay people and, uh, and what they did to the Washington Post reporter and kind of speaking flippantly about it, really just a poor choice of words. That being said, I think most Americans and sports fans are a forgiving lot. We've seen it for time immemorial that uh, the comeback story is a popular thing in our country, especially in the realm of sports. Uh, should Phil Mickelson uh, apologize maybe in a, in a better way, kind of take stock of the situation and decide to, to have another run at the PGA Tour, I would think that uh, that the folks would be ultimately letting the time pass and forgive Phil Mickelson, who for the most part is very good with the fans, good with his time, has been uh, an asset to the professional game of golf. So I think he's in a poor spot now. I was surprised at some of the comments he made. But I would say that there, it's not uh, not fair to say that there's no way out of this moment uh, for the World Golf Hall of Fame member. Damon Scotty Scheffler is on a heck of a run this year. Four wins in the last two and a half months, plus barely losing in a playoff this past weekend, which would have been his second straight major win. I think most people are thinking he's the runaway best player on tour right now. But his best friend, the guy he lost to in the playoff, Sam Burns, is number two in the FedEx Cup standings. He's won three times now this season, has seven top tens. Sam Burns is putting together a pretty strong season in his own right. Yeah, a couple of 25-year-old American stars who uh, were housemates during the Masters tournament, by the way, and Sam Burns hung around there to to uh, greet uh, Scotty Scheffler when he was able to win that green jacket. And it's been fun to watch these two young players who 
gosh, you want to talk about two players that really don't have any weaknesses. They hit the ball well. They have wonderful short games. They putt beautifully. I remember having a conversation with John Fields, the head coach at the golf school for uh, University of Texas, and this was before Scotty ever went on the PGA Tour, and, and he told me, Damon, Scotty has the it factor like Duvall and Tiger and Jack and Spieth. And I'm, I'm like transcribing and I'm typing seriously and feverishly, and I'm thinking, wait a second, this is just school pride talking. This is before he ever won in Phoenix, and, and now here we are a few months later. I'm like, man, maybe John Cecil was on to something when he said that he has a short game that rivals the best to ever do it and that it's only a matter of time. And this was pre-first PGA Tour win, and now you look at what he's done, a winner in Phoenix, a winner at one of the most important events of the season, the Arnold Palmer Invitational, and, of course, the World Golf Championship event, the match play, and then the Masters, and now a runner-up finish at Colonial, not far from where he grew up. So I think Scotty Scheffler is here to stay. We know that professional careers can be complicated. Golf even more complicated than that. But he's someone who seems to have a good head on his shoulders, uh, lots of good family around him. I've actually chatted with his parents at the Ryder Cup. His dad just so thrilled uh, about Scotty Scheffler being at Wisconsin, a part of that American team. And I think we'll see both Scotty Scheffler and Sam Burns representing the U.S. Uh, for President's Cup and Ryder Cups to come as well. And Damon, after all the Bryson DeChambeau talk last year and the tremendous transformation of his body, all the weight gain, the swing speed, the long driving contest, and as people predicted, his body has now started to break down. He's only played in a handful of tournaments this year. He's missed three cuts in five tournaments when he's able to start playing again. Do you think we'll see him with the same style, the swinging out of his shoes? Or do you think he's realized that the body just isn't made to handle the torque that he was putting on? Yeah, I think this has been a, a teaching moment for, for Bryson DeChambeau on a lot of levels, the physical aspect of the game. He is not a world-long drive guy. I mean, he can dabble with the Kyle Brookshires and the Maurice Allens uh, from time to time, the Tim Burks. But I think to have a long-lasting PGA Tour career, someone who needs his hands. I mean, I think about Tiger and talking about uh, those three months in a hospital bed after uh, the car accident, he was like, where are my golf clubs? I just want the club in my hands, the fingers, the hands, feel. Feels are everything to a golfer. And for him to have this hook of the hammock surgery on his hand, and obviously the, the swing speeds he's generated are, are part of that. He has added weight, speed, and body mass to, to a frame that was a lot much, uh, much more wispy when he was at SMU winning an NCAA title, winning a U.S. amateur. He was already a PGA Tour winner. I think it was fun while it lasted, uh, the, you know, driving over the par 5-6 at, at Bay Hill and, and taking on some shots. But I think for, for his longevity, he and his coach Chris Como probably have to dial things back a little bit. Chris told me uh, last year that they always had kind of the, the style of putting down those pebbles you know, so they could find their way home you know, a la Hansel and Gretel, that they would never do something to his golf swing where they didn't feel there was a way home. So I'm going to be fascinated to watch what the next few months look like for Bryce. He's in the field this week. He, of course, is a U.S. Open champ from a couple of years ago at Wingfoot, wants to be as healthy as he can be outside of Boston. But I just don't think this this method of, of swinging 200 miles per hour ball speed is going to be uh, able to sustain him into his 40s. And as we can watch these PGA Tour players, they're competing and winning in their 40s. Tiger's done it. Phil's done it. VJ did it. I think uh, if Bryson wants to be one of those players, an all-time great longevity is a huge part of that puzzle. I think it's been a teaching moment for him. The less turbulent on the golf course and off, the better for Bryson DeChambeau in 2022. Last fall, you hosted a Q&A session with the Cordes sisters. What was it like for you to get to spend time with them? It didn't suck. <laughs> it was pretty fun. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, and they're two, they're two delightful <laughs> young women, first of all. Beautiful, funny, um, just two great players. To be able to sit down with them and pick their brains on their friendship, on their sisterhood, how much of a supporter – uh, big sister Jessica is for Nelly, uh, the younger sister, and Jessica, kind of like Venus uh, to Spina, was saying, wait till my younger sister gets out on tour and wait till you see what she can do. And 
so glad that Nellie is feeling healthy. She's uh, in the field of the U.S. Women's Open after having that blood clot surgery. You're talking about someone who appeared to be the picture of health, and it just, you know, reminded all of us how fragile life is. And uh, She was very, very happy to be back in the field. But, yeah, just to talk to those two about the championship pedigree they have, their brother, Sebastian Corda, one of the best tennis players in the world, just competing out at the French Open. We'll see him at Wimbledon. They, of course, the son of Peter Corda, a major champ from the tennis world as well. I just love the fact that nothing seems too big for that family. You know, while others might be nervous, uh, they get to have the the companionship of, of the sibling on the LPGA Tour to share the highs and lows of golf, the challenges, to share a meal. They told me they don't talk much golf when they're together. Sometimes they do, but for the most part, it's about having someone just that uh, that looks like them that can relate to the to the ups and downs. Have a travel partner, a shopping partner, a dinner companion, and it's almost like an unspoken safety net that they know that they have the others back. And I just love the fact that much like Venus and Serena, where people would ask them, "Well, how competitive are you? What's it like trying to beat your sister?" You know, they are sisters. They are blood. Uh, before they are LPGA players. And, of course, when they're inside the ropes, they want to win. But, man, the support that they have for one another, the hug that Jessica gave Nelly after Nelly won that Olympic gold medal outside Tokyo, those are the images that come to mind. They're like that on TV. They're like that in person. And what wonderful assets they are to the LPGA and professional golf. And speaking of late last year, you celebrated a milestone birthday at the end of December. What's it like now being able to go out and play on the Champions Tour? Yeah, you know, uh, Stephen Alker and Bernard Langer, uh, I'm coming for them with Tom Patrick's help. <laughs> I can tee it forward now, which is great. I, I can say to my buddies that are a little younger that want to hit from the black and the blue tees, I'm going to be you know, hitting from the white tees, which is just fine with me. Um, yeah, you know, I'll be getting my AARP card, I imagine, in the mail <laughs> <laughs> at any day coming up soon. So. Uh, the early bird discount at Denny's as well. There's <laughs> lots to look forward to north of 50, Chris. <laughs> Good for you, David. I'm happy for you, my friend. <laughs> David, one more oh, before I let you fun. go. I get, speaking of blood, I always uh, like to hear how, how your boys doing. I like uh, seeing the family pictures that you post on Instagram. How's the family? Uh, they're terrific. It, it is so fun being a dad. I, I uh, was down in South Florida with my wife and boys last week. My boys, uh, Despite all of my urgings and Golf Channel being on the on the television 24/7, they've become pretty good little tennis players. And, and we were down in South Florida where they were uh, working with Todd Whittem, who's a fantastic tennis teacher who has a bunch of junior players. So they spent their Memorial Day weekend, you know, playing some tennis. But then I got to take them to a water park. We met up with some friends in Orlando. They are just fun. They're they're about to turn 11 years of age. They're still in that kind of sweet spot where they think mom and dad are pretty cool. Uh, my boys still hold my hand sometimes when we walk. I rode the water slide with them. And as much as it's cool being on TV and, and playing some golf from time to time, there's nothing better than being a dad. I just absolutely am tickled and blessed and thankful to have three boys that are sports crazed as I am, born, you know, one minute apart, about to celebrate the 11th birthday. Uh, good young men, good students. Uh, they're eating us out of house and home. We can't keep the milk and the cereal <laughs> and all those things uh, as easy as we used to. But, man, it's fun being a parent and it's fun being their dad. That's awesome. Good for you, Dan. Before I let you go, remind our listeners how they can see you on the Golf Channel and then follow you on social media as well. Yeah, I'm co-hosting Golf Today these days, formerly Morning Drive, now Golf Today. and. Um, not as active as I have been on Twitter, uh, cause Twitter can be a little bit dangerous sometimes. Everybody seems so angry these days, but I occasionally show up on uh, Twitter at Damon Hack GC and also at Damon Hack GC on Instagram. And if your listeners are into wine, I have a Instagram page uh, at goats and grapes, which of course the goats being the greatest of all time, kind of an intersection between sports figures and wine. And I actually have a cool a conversation coming up uh, with a, a book publisher. I may actually be able to finally put my love of wine and sports together uh, for a book sometime down the road. So very excited about my uh, hobby, of course, which is, uh, you know, tasting some good Barolo or Cabernet Sauvignon from time to time. Good for you. I look forward to that. Damon, it's always great having you as part of the show, my friend. It's informative 
and it's a lot of fun. We laugh and that, that, that makes a great segment. So I can't thank you enough for coming back and being a part of the show. I'm already looking forward to next time. Chris, you're the, the brightest light on Twitter and, and one of the brightest lights that I've known in this game. Your positivity is uh, infectious on social media and, and on this uh, show as well. So thank you for having me on. Look forward to our next chat. Take care, Damon. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. And you, Chris. Thank you, Damon. That's a great Damon hack, folks. Again, at Ghost and Grapes on, uh, on Instagram and and like you said, at, at Damon Hack GC, you can find him on Instagram and periodically on Twitter. Just a finer human being. And Tom Patrick pointed this out a couple of segments ago. Just one of the finest human beings you'll find anywhere. Not only in the sports world, but just in the world, period. Damon is a, is a wonderful uh, friend and he's a, he's a great guest and he always makes me laugh and I always learn an awful lot gaining from his insights from his years, uh, both writing about sports and then being a big part of it at the golf channel. So I can't wait to have him back on the show again soon. Uh, boy, it's just, I I'm grinning from ear to ear for the time that I got to spend with him. So that says all you need to know about how great Damon Hack is. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode of next on the T my sincere thanks again to Jane Blaylock, Tom Patry, Jeff Tracy, and Damon Hack for joining me tonight. Scheduled to join me next week are one of the all-time great ball strikers, Tim Simpson, will be back, as will 1991 Open champion Ian Baker Finch. I'll also be joined by two great caddies out on tour, Paul Tesori and our good friend Kip Henley. So folks, it's going to be a great show. I hope you'll come back and be a part of it with us. You can listen to this show as a podcast on just about every major podcasting app, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast.co, Audioboom, Player.fm, and Podbean as well. Please check out our website next on the T.net to see what our upcoming guest schedule looks like. Plus, we've got links there to recent episodes and individual guest segments. So whether you've got two hours or 20 minutes, we've got some great content on the site for you. Folks, I can't thank you all again for choosing to listen to this show tonight. I know you've got a lot of great podcasts out there to choose from. I am very thankful that you're making Next on the T one of them. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends.